What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the You Know Ball podcast. I am your host, Trill Bro Dude, and Tyrese Maxey is absolutely unbelievable. I don't know what else to say about the kid, but he proved it again tonight against the number one seed Miami Heat, knocking them off when the Sixers did not have Joel Embiid. They did not have James Harden. It was a great team victory, but Maxey was the reason that they closed out this game hitting every big shot, not being afraid of the moment, even making a hustle defensive play to close out the game. He was just absolutely amazing and kind of proof of something that I touched on in this episode. But it's something that I want to focus a little bit more on, which is the fact that even with everything that has been surrounding the team, there's been a lot of negativity, not just like going back to the Ben Simmons stuff, but like since we've gotten James Harden, it's all all people have mo- mainly focused on myself included has been the negatives, the depth issues, the coaching issues, the backup center issues, all of that stuff. And while all that stuff is very important and it's something that I talk about on this episode, the bigger picture is is much, much better than it was before. And I think that we kind of get lost in all of this reacting to every game treating everything like it's the end of the world when the Sixers lose to the Raptors like they did the other night. But ultimately, the Sixers have three star players now. Tyrese Maxey is now a star. We all can admit that. James Harden is a star, even with his flaws, and Joel Embiid is an MVP candidate. The Sixers are going to be just fine. They might not win this year because of all the things that I've mentioned, that I just mentioned, but Maxey is just proof that this team will be fine. If you go back to the 1920 season and you look at it versus where we were at at the end of that season, we got swept by the Celtics in the playoffs. We were a disappointing six seed, had basically no hope to where we are now. It's a lot better to be on this side. So every time you freak out over a regular season game, every time you get doomer about maybe the team losing in the second round or the conference finals or whatever it is, just remember... The Sixers have done the hard part. They've gotten three guys that are good enough to be the best players on championship team. And everything else, all the depth issues that we have, all of the stuff will get itself sorted out. I think that Daryl Morey can figure that stuff out in the offseason if they don't win this year. And I just want to keep reminding myself that and reminding you guys that things are way better than they could be. And a lot of that is due to the fact that we hit on the maxi pick. And I just think that we need to be just generally speaking more positive, um, having a more positive outlook on the team. I'm going to try to do that. (laughs) I promise you I'm going to try. This episode was recorded before that, though. So keep that in mind. So Tyrese Maxi's goaded better. Sadly, you can buy the shirt. I don't have the shirt right now, but you can buy the shirt. The Maxi Better Sadly shirt that we made. There's a lot of other merch you can buy. The link is in the description, so go check that out. Duani designed them, as I said on the last episode. Thank you so much to her. They've been selling great. I want to keep keep those going. Keep the brand strong. You know the vibes. So there's that. Also on this episode, I had audio issues. Actually, first time in a while I've had audio issues. I didn't realize my mic wasn't (laughs) recording, if you can believe it, and my computer ended up catching my audio. So apologies for that. Otherwise, we talked about March Madness prospects. We talked about the Sixers' last few games before the Heat game, before this awesome game. Shout out to Shake Milton, too. Also fucking coming up big, hasn't played big minutes recently. Furkan Korkmaz finding his groove again. Paul Millsap. Honestly, at this point, like Paul Millsap looks dead when he's on the court, but is he a better option than DeAndre Jordan? He might be. That's how sad things are for DeAndre Jordan right now. I I don't know what to take from this game, but awesome team win from the Sixers. They can kind of control their own destiny now too. They can kind of, they have a shot at the one seed now. I think they're only two games back from the one seed somehow, which is hard to believe. I still don't think they're going to get there by the end of the season, but they at least have a shot at that. And they can probably angle themselves for the four seed if they want. So things are looking up. And we've won three of four. We're like eight and three with Harden. Our offense is absolutely amazing. So let's try to focus on some of the positives instead of being doomer and negative all the time. So I was glad I got to do an intro. I haven't done an intro in quite some time. So it was good to talk up top. This this game from Maxi and this game from the Sixers was so, so much fun that I decided I had to record an intro and 
if they do get the one seed or if they do, you know, get the four seed, I feel pretty good about the Miami matchup. And I mentioned that on this podcast, but I think that the Sixers are in better shape than, than we might be giving them credit for. So enjoy this episode. Uh, do all the usual stuff. This is on YouTube, by the way. So if you're not watching on YouTube, do that. And please subscribe to the page if you haven't already. Like the video. Do all that shit. This is the, the longest intro I've done in quite some time. But um, I really appreciate your support. And if you can donate, you can buy a shirt, you can do whatever to support the podcast. I would really, really appreciate it. So I'll talk to you guys later. Peace. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the You Know Ball podcast. I am your host, Trill Bro Dude, and today I am excited to have onto the podcast a NBA draft writer for No Ceilings. You can follow him at Bomb Boards. We have Maxwell Bombach. What's going on, Maxwell? Not a whole lot. I am glad to be here. Excited to talk some draft and excited to talk some Sixers. Actually, I don't know how excited I am to talk Sixers, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> It, it does feel like any time that I, I I get a sense of optimism about the team and like kind mm-hmm. of the direction things are going in, like I felt pretty inspired after the Mavs and Cavs game that I was like, I feel like something around the corner is about to hit me in the face. And that's what happened last night with the Raptors game. So yeah what let's ju- we could just talk about the last three games in general since I last recorded and let's just talk a little bit about your thoughts on what you've seen because i know that you haven't you're a Sixers fan but you haven't been totally plugged in this season for for some reason so what have you thought about from the last three games yeah so i've i've been watching so much like college and international stuff this year just because the draft is like the primary thing i cover so most of the time when i'm watching like sixers or like i watch bulls just because they're on local tv a lot here uh so it's easy to throw on but uh when i watch that i feel like i'm not observing as intensely so this was like the first time i sat down and like watched sixers games with a critical eye in a while and like the first two games were great and then that raptors game yesterday just like took the absolute life out of me the yeah. offense in the second half was mind numbing and the thing that that really killed me more than anything is tobias passing up open look still um but that I now have to ask you a question that's being asked by a lot of important basketball minds. Do we need to run more plays for Tobias Harris? No, absolutely not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's insane to me that people are insinuating that the, the problem with the Sixers offense that has like a 125 offensive rating when Joel mm-hmm. Embiid and James Harden are on the court, which would be by far the best in the NBA, is not that Tobias Harris needs more actions run for him. <laughs> Tobias Harris needs to do what he was doing. And it felt like he was learning really. It was well, for like, sure, yeah. it felt like there was a stretch there where it was like, Oh my God, Tobias is actually shooting open threes. He's, you know, competing defensively. He's doing more role player things than we have asked of him in the past. And then things uh, stagnated a little bit last night. He was in foul trouble. He's kind of a guy. He's kind of a guy that plays very much in his emotions. So like totally. when he was getting kind of some ticky tack foul calls going against him, he let that affect him. And the Sixers in general, even I would say everyone on the team except for Maxi kind of plays like that. Like, 100%. They kind, like I would say Harden and Embiid and Tobias. Like if you like, we can talk about the Raptors game a little bit, but just like, Coming out of that game, I actually didn't feel as bad as I thought I would. Like, I just said, like, last night obviously threw me for a loop and I was kind of crushed because I expected to go in today having a happy, all-around good podcast. But at the same time, like, I didn't come out of it, like, with, like, this soul-crushing feeling because if Tobias, Joel, and Harden just lay eggs offensively, you're not going to win. No. And, and, <laughs> yeah. And that, that just kind of is what it is. I think it did. The lack of offense in the second half though, did kind of freak me out about the backup center position again, For sure. which I know like, and it's too late. It's too late. And that's the thing that is killing me is that it would have been great. If we'd seen Paul Reed throughout the season, it would be great if we could get Bassy some looks, but I just don't think doc is going to do that at this point. It's too uh, late because we have Doc as our coach. Yeah, exactly. Really exactly. What it is. Yeah. And if we had a normal coach, that might be like, shit, we got two or three weeks left here to kind of experiment, figure some things out, and uh, maybe figure out if we can have a useful backup going into the playoffs. But Doc is just addicted to playing the corpses of DeAndre Jordan and Paul Millsap. It was just like tonight, I, that we're recording this before the Heat game, mm-hmm. but 
Harden and Embiid are out. Even if Harden played, Bassey and Reed are getting no run. No. And Reed last night in the in the Raptors game. They were playing him with DeAndre Jordan. Like it it almost feels like it's a joke at this point. Like it almost feels like he's he's clowning us. Like it, it, oh, you want me to play Paul Reed more? Sure. Let me put George Niang at the three and DeAndre <laughs> Jordan at the four and Danny Green at the two and leave Harden with literally no one that can do anything with the ball. Yeah, and Niang, okay, so this is something George Niang screens. Have you talked about this at all on your show? No, I have not. Okay, no. so this is like my big observation that I've taken away. His screening is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. So like most dudes in the NBA, they set a screen, they like protect their junk or whatever. And George Niang like keeps his arms up and does something that I can only describe as like if your friend invited you to play in his rec touch football league and he made you play offensive line and like you weren't sure how physical you were allowed to be. Like that is how George's Niang blocks. It's very just like, I'm just going to like put my arms up here and like kind of touch you a little bit. And it's the strangest thing I've ever seen. I've never seen anybody in the NBA set screens like that. Well, I tweeted uh, last night and I said, uh, he's, uh, you know, big, like clay shoots like Steph. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, like him with the three, like that's the other thing too, is just like the, the, we don't have that hybrid three, four that can defend anybody while also producing anything on offense. We don't have a three, really. Is no, is honestly, it's like, like twos and like fives that can be like sort of play four. It's like, unbelievable. It's like Thibel is like kind of a three, but like offensively he gives you nothing. Mm -hmm. Danny Green is probably more of a two, but has to play the three. And Yang has to play the three. Tobias sometimes has to play the three. The Sixers have no real threes on their entire roster. No, and it's it's a problem. And I thought I thought like. In those first two games, like in the Raptors game, or not the Raptors game, the Mavs game and the Cavs game, I thought that Tybal looked so much better on offense. Like, because when he plays with the starters, he just gets those free cutting lanes every sure. now and then. And he looked really confident taking his open shots and things like that. So, like, I think there are going to be games where he produces enough on offense that it's okay to, like, play him at the three. But just the forward rotation is a mess. Like, the yeah, forward rotation yeah, and backup honestly. center rotation, I just... The, it's, it's rough. The rap, the wing, the wings are bad, mm -hmm. and the first quarter of the Nuggets game and the first quarter of the Raptors game, Thibel has looked incredible offensively. Like mm -hmm. you said, he's he's taking his open shots. He's he's taking advantage of those cutting lanes because teams are just going to kind of leave him open. Mm -hmm. But as we saw last night, over the course of a game, teams will literally just leave him open, and it will stagnate the court offense a lot and we know that mm -hmm. that is going to happen and it's something that kind of just comes with the Thibel experience but if you, you know it's not completely unrelated to Harden and Bede and Tobias struggling like I think all three of those guys thrive with space around them yeah but at the same time like I don't think it led to them missing every shot they took like, no I, like I said it with with um with Harden and Embiid I haven't said this on the podcast yet but it's almost like when you go into a game, you can just kind of feel that they're going to have a bad game. And like, yeah, they they're a very like vibe heavy team. Yes. Very, very vibe heavy. And you can tell when they care and when they don't care. And last night very much felt like a, we don't give a shit game. And in bead and Harden, when they are struggling from the field, it feels like no shots are ever going in. It's, it's kind of crazy. Like last night when when we were down uh, down the stretch and we were trying to come back, like the Raptors gave us every opportunity to do that. And there was not one time I felt like they were going to win that game because mm -hmm. Harden and Embiid, it's just like their touch escapes them in certain games. <laughs> yeah. Like, like they're yeah. good shooters, but their mm -hmm. touch is just completely removed. And a lot of it is just due to like the, like you said, like the vibe of the game. And it's, it's tricky against a team like the Raptors, too, because they are one of those annoying teams that's going to try really hard every regular yep. season game. Like, when you have an off game against them, they don't care who you are. They're just going to come out and work, and they have 9 million guys on their roster that are 6'9 with 7'3 wingspans that are smart and are going to play really hard. And it's like, once the vibes are off, if you're not trying that hard, like they're going to take advantage of it every single time. So yep. that was the other they're thing the too. Like, opposite of the Sixers. Yeah. Really, and, like, like, yeah. and their offense was bad down the stretch too. Like it was close yeah. to the end of the second half, but I, or at the end of the first half, but I feel like both teams had around like 55, 60 points at the end of the first half. And then the final score is like, it, it, it was low. Like it just, they didn't have it going either, but they cared so much on defense that 
they created problems. There was a possession where Scotty Barnes guarded like every good player on the Sixers and it was, it was unreal, but yeah, yeah. like teams like that, you just can't have bad games against during the regular season. Exactly. Yeah. And, it, and it, as I, I've said before, Nick nurse is a basketball fascist. He will, he will remove all of the joy that you get from watching basketball. If you're playing against his team, like mm-hmm. he's going to grind the game to a halt. He's going to, he's going to beat you down mentally over the course of a game because he has these guys who try really hard. He's a really good defensive mind and he can figure out ways to, you know, get into your stars heads. And that's mm-hmm. what he did really last night with the Sixers. And, and it is frustrating because it's like, I've been looking across the Eastern Conference, and it's something that I am a little bit worried about when it comes to the playoffs, is like, I don't think the Sixers have the coaching advantage against any team. No. Like, because, I don't know. As somebody who lives in Chicago, I feel like I want them in a playoff series against the Bulls somehow, some way, just because the Bulls are total bum slayers and don't have any big men that can play defense or any forward size players that, like, are good. Um, So... And, and like Billy Donovan is like a good regular season coach, but hasn't been great during the playoffs. That might be the one team, but otherwise just up and down. Like I don't want to face any of these coaches in a, a chess match across seven games. Oh no, absolutely not. Because like the Raptors made adjustments last night. The Sixers don't, mm-hmm. will never make in game adjustments with doc rivers. Well, no. <laughs> and just even throughout the season. Cause I feel like earlier in the year, he'd be like, Oh, like maybe if we end up against Boston, like it seems like Ime Adoka doesn't have the locker room. And it's like, no, you figured that out. It's, <laughs> fine now like they know what they're doing there's just not not a good team that i'm feeling great about in terms of just like shoving them in a locker from yeah a exactly standpoint and now it feels like you know i've kind of once i like i said last episode i have lowered my expectations a little bit just about the team in general because mm-hmm. i feel like i feel i still feel like the top three aren't gonna look like that for i mean and maxi was fine last night i think he actually had some crazy finishes and and in in the Cavaliers game holy shit he was absolutely incredible I mean that guy is like fucking Steph Curry against the Cavs for some reason (laughs) and um it does feel like you know the Mavs game was great like when they hit their shots and it was unsustainably hot shooting a lot of it you know when Danny Green Mm -hmm. and George Niang are gonna hit all of their open shots you're not gonna have much of a chance against the Sixers but the Sixers kind of like the variance with the Sixers and like their upside when it comes to playoff time is going to be directly related to the bench because we know that we can trust the three top guys throughout a seven game series. They might have off nights Mm -hmm. and might have an off night. Harden might have an off night. You just got to hope it doesn't happen on the same night like it did last night. Yeah. So, and I think that they have enough top end talent to carry them through some of that. And then I trust Maxi on any given night. And then you can trust one of Tobias or Thibel. For some reason, neither of them can play <laughs> right on the same night. It's like, yeah, it's like Tobias had this great stretch and Thibel was struggling during some of it. And then T- Tobias has a lays an egg last night and Thibel's great. So like, we can't seem to get those two on the same page when it comes to playing together and playing well at the same time. So you're going to get at least one of those two having a competent game. And then, as I said on the last episode, it's like the four and a half through nine in the rotation, because I don't know if Doc's going to shrink down the rotations to eight in the playoffs. He didn't last year. No, he played the full bench lineup in the playoff last year. Like, I have no reason to believe that he would shrink the bench down. There's right. no there's no reason based on any indication that we've seen so far that that's going to happen. The only thing I can think of is the fact that he doesn't, have the options like like as as frustrating as bench was last year like you couldn't play ben with with dwight so that Mm -hmm. expands it a little bit okay so that makes it you're not gonna not play thigh and like yeah george hill didn't look good don't get me wrong but like no but but you could understand the temptation to play george hill yeah like you can understand an old guy coach being like yeah he's been there before he's a veteran i trust him yeah exactly yeah and like if you just go down the lineups that we were running last year, like Cork Moss was like justified to spot in the rotation last year. Like shake had his big game. So like you could, and Maxi obviously was going to play off the bench. So you could, but now you're looking at it from the opposite view where you go, how can I figure out how to get three or four guys just to stay on the court and not bleed yeah. points? Because it's funny when we first traded for Harden, my thought was, well, Doc said today, I'm not really worried about the 
the rotations. I'm just worried about like figuring out the lineups. And I'm like, <laughs> the same same exact thing. Yeah. I don't I don't really know what the difference oh, is. Oh no. There. And like figuring out like the Harden lineups and figuring out the Embiid lineups. And we don't have a ton of time mm-hmm. to do that. But if you are playing DeAndre Jordan. We're punting those minutes. We're just hoping that we lose those minutes by 10 points and we don't lose yeah. those minutes by 20 points. That's really what it comes he, down to. It's like, he's terrible. Yeah. Well, he like, can't get off the floor anymore. Like the, yeah. there was a, like that one clip that was going around today of like the, the several rebounds in a row where he's jump, he's like jumping over and over again and jumping three inches every single time he jumps. It's there bad. was a play in the Mavs game where he like kind of played cat and mouse on a drive and they kicked it to Dorian Finney Smith in the corner and the the closeout technique was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life because he knew he couldn't get there in time. He knew he like would not have the time to load up and jump and contest. So he sort of like bent over and hunched and walked toward them like he was greeting an arthritic dog. Like he was just <laughs> like, oh, come here, come here, Dorian Finney Smith. Like it was the strangest thing I've ever seen. And Finney Smith hit the shot. But like he just, he can't move anymore. Like in yeah. when he's in the dunker spot on offense and Harden telegraphs him a lob, he can go up and get it. But exactly. otherwise, like any sort of quick twitch, quick reaction, it's gone. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say was like the times that we've seen him have successful runs recently is literally because James Harden shoots a shot right next to the rim and then he can just tip slam it in from the dunker spot. That's ex- yeah. exactly what I was thinking is like offensively, he has really no utility other than that role, which is stand in the dunker spot, g- jump up and whatever. Con- he doesn't contest anything at the rim anymore. It's like, no, he doesn't he even can't. try. Like yeah, he, he just he doesn't have the springs now. Yeah. And if that's the case, he can't protect the rim. He can't, he cannot defend in space. Him defending in space is no. even worse than him protecting the rim. And then on top of that, the only time that he's valuable as a roller or someone who's going to catch lobs is when he's at a standstill directly under the basket. Then, like, what are we doing here, really? Like, That's why I really wish that we, like, gave Bassey a shot. And I feel like I was higher on Bassey than a lot of draft people last year. And by that, I mean I had him ranked, like, 48th uh, because draft people yeah. hate centers. Uh, yeah, that's but, true. Uh, yeah, but I, I liked Bassey, and – He's I been think good that, at times this year, well, too. And the thing is, like, he's dominating the G League. And I know people are like, oh, it's the G League or whatever. But, like, the one thing that tends to translate is dominance. And he's blocking, like, five shots a game or something in the G League. He was a prolific shot blocker in college. We know he can protect the rim. If we can at least just get a guy to protect the rim, are his feet great in the space? No. Is no. he going to slide with guys in the perimeter? No. But if he can at least protect the rim, that's something that DeAndre Jordan's not doing. And I trust him to catch a lob. Yeah, like, and he's a, he can set screens. That's it. Like, yes. Set screens, catch lobs, protect the rim. Like, that's literally that's all it. we need for 10 minutes a game, not even in the playoffs, probably eight minutes a game. And DeAndre Jordan is, and Paul Millsap are completely incapable of that. And now it's frustrating because it's like, okay, so the one in bead game that you're holding out in bead, you're also holding out Harden. So we, tonight against the Heat. So, like, we won't even get the opportunity to see, because, like, Bassey offensively is very limited and does not really mm-hmm. bring anything to the table yet at least. Mm -hmm. And if he has someone who can simplify his role for him, that is a high level pick and roll creator that will just create open opportunities and make his life a lot easier, then yeah, give it a shot. Like see if it fucking works. Cause like I'm, I'm actually, it's funny. You said that thing about the G league dominance. Cause like, that's how Mm -hmm. I felt about Paul Reed last year. But I feel like the thing that doesn't translate with Paul Reed is just like, the guy's basketball IQ is like really bad. Like he yeah. doesn't know where to be ever. He no. never knows where to be on offense or defense. And, and that's th- all you need from your backup center is just a person who can occupy space. And that's that like doesn't hard. die on the court. And that was like sort of Paul Reed's appeal in college. Was it like he's just everywhere? And like yeah. in the NBA, when you're playing against better, smarter players, you can't be everywhere anymore. Like it's just <laughs> exactly. not. It's a wider court. It's more spaced out. It doesn't work. Um, and the other thing with Bassey too is he's just bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, like a lot of those power forward size centers tend to do really well in the G League. Like that is an archetype that works there really well. But with Bassey, like Bassey's actual center size. Yeah. Um. And, and like, look, I'm not saying like start playing Bassey 13 minutes a night or whatever, but, and he's not going to be perfect when they play him. He's going to make mistakes. He's a rookie. Like rookies are bad in general, Like, mm-hmm. but I think that he might have more to offer and I think it's worth exploring and I don't think it's going to be explored. 
exactly. And, and and that's the frustrating thing to me is like, I'm okay with Charles Bassey sucking. I'm not okay with, with never getting the chance to even see him suck. Like that, that's <laughs> the problem with me is like, I would rather have him have an equal opportunity to just go out there and fucking suck. And if mm -hmm. he's bad, then okay, he's bad. But like, we have only seen him in glimpses this year. And like, mm -hmm. I watched him play really good defense on Jokic for a half of basketball. And I have watched him do enough things that I think that like, I'm not a draft guy. I didn't follow his come up. I don't know anything about him other than the fact that like, he was a high recruit at one point and then he kind of struggled in college. And now he's kind of figuring out his game at the NBA level. And once again, dominating the G League has had moments in the NBA in a small amount of time. And from there, he has basically gotten zero opportunities due to the fact that we have a coach who's so stubborn and is only ever going to rely on veteran players. And it's extremely frustrating because I feel like a broken record saying this, but it, it is like this, the one thing that I keep going back to because it has bitten the Sixers in the ass in the past. And I feel like, they're going to need to figure out how to survive those minutes without Joel. And they're going to have, and, and on the inverse of that, if, if they're taking Harden off the court, they're going to need to figure out how the offense can be sustainable with, without having a Seth Curry level shooter, without having guys that you can put around in bead when Harden sits, because what's happened so far is the Sixers are actually, and like, I saw people complaining about like, certain things with the starting lineup and like, yeah, the starting lineup has had moments where they haven't looked great. Like the second half of the, the Raptors game, the third mm -hmm. quarter of the Cavs game, like they definitely had their struggles. And I am a little bit worried about the offense translating to be like a high level offense in the playoffs, mm -hmm. but the offense, the starting lineup is not the problem. The problem no. is, the, is the bench and making it so that you can have three or four playable guys off the bench in the playoffs is going to be a major issue. And if you look at this on off, numbers like you can't take a massive amount from them because it's still such a small sample which is one of the issues with trading for a star halfway through the season is you don't really get a large enough sample to take anything from that data but so far the overall has shown that the Sixers defense is a fucking disaster when Joel Embiid is off the court yeah. 125 off a uh, defensive rating when he sits and they are their offense is a disaster when James Harden sits and it's maxi and Embiid running the backup units something like a uh, low hundreds for the offensive rating and they're losing those minutes by a lot and they're losing the the you know when one of the star sits they're losing those minutes bottom line so you just got to hope that like these the the conditioning is good enough and that they can stay together on the court for a large majority of these games and then like what if one of them gets into foul trouble in the playoffs we know doc's benching them immediately yeah. like like there is there's a lot of things to worry about but like the one positive i can take from this is like i think the starters will be fine in most matchups uh and i think that 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 harden and beat are good enough to carry them to at least the second round if not the conference finals yeah i still have a lot of confidence in just the two of them as a whole and even maxi and like I guess Tobias to like a much lesser extent, but like the top three guys, I, I still feel really good about. I feel really good about how the offense looks. It's yeah. Just like the second unit defense without Embiid is just like the thing that absolutely terrifies me. And like part of that's that rapper series from a few years ago. And like, it's always going to be in the back of our heads, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I wish he would try Charles Bassey because he could attempt to protect the rim. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's kind of like, you just need someone who will try. And, like, mm -hmm. DeAndre Jordan is just incapable. And, like, we already saw Paul Millsap is incapable. Sadly and weirdly enough, Paul Millsap's on-offs were significantly better than DeAndre Jordan's. <laughs> and Charles Bassey's have not been good this year. I don't even want to no, say that yeah. Charles Bassey's have been good. But Charles Bassey, when he is on the court, and once again, very small sample size. It's only, like, a li it's like 200 minutes or something. He hasn't mm -hmm. played a lot. And, but the one thing you can take from it is that the defense is actually held together with him on the court and the offense is very bad because we had, but, before we got James Harden, we didn't have anyone. Well, that's the thing the is I was going to say, I think the offense with him paired with James Harden would probably look quite a bit better. Uh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the thing is like, you know, people are freaking out and like, I tweeted at someone earlier because they were like, maybe Harden's really washed. And I'm like, look, man, 
Harden's going to have these nights where he doesn't look great when the shot isn't falling because he doesn't really have a ton of counters in his game. When Mm -hmm. the step back is not falling, when the floater's not falling, and he's not able to get to the rim every possession. Like, I've seen some encouraging things. I think he's been able to get past some pretty good defenders in some of these. Like, I mean, I thought he... Yeah, well, like, the isolation numbers, like you've talked about before, they're still stellar. Like, he's still really good, like, 95% of the time. Right. It's and it, and to the eye test, he is he doesn't have that first step anymore. He's mm-hmm. not as explosive as he once was. Maybe the hamstring still is an issue. Maybe it's just age. Whatever. The Sixers' offense is still really good with him on the court, and like ultimately, what the downfall of this team will be will be the defense, and the downfall of this team will be the bench. And yeah. one of the reasons why I've been a little bit more pessimistic recently is because I feel like I can look around like. You know, you like when you start to match up hunt for the playoffs and you're like, yes. ah, just give me Chicago or Cleveland or whatever. I'm like, you might not be a real contender if you look at Boston, you look at mm-hmm. Milwaukee, you look at uh, the Celtics and you go, oh, if we could just avoid their bracket. And it's like, well, at some point you're going to have to beat a good team and mm-hmm. you might have to have a bad matchup against you. And if you can't get through that series, then you're probably not a real contender. And it's it's so tough too with like the Tobias Niang sort of forward rotation when there are just so many good guys that size in the East right now. It's like it's like the one spot that you need competent defenders with like yep. Tatum, Giannis, like just up and down the entire Baby. conference. Durant, yeah, exactly. Like yeah, even like DeRozan when the Bulls play him there, it's just like we just don't have like the NFTs can guard DeRozan fine, but like actually there's... last game Tobias guarded DeRozan and did a great job on him. Okay. I was pretty shocked. And and Thibel actually somehow like breaks Zach Levine's brain. I don't understand. He like t- uh NBA Couchside, who is now a villain mm-hmm. in the Sixers Twitter world, but he uh he said that he turns Thibel turns Levine into a himbo, like a like a male bimbo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he just like doesn't know what to do against Thibel when he plays against no. Chicago is the only matchup I'm not really worried about because we're four and zero against them this year. Lonzo yeah. apparently might not even be coming back now. That's like, another team with like no forward size defenders or bench. Like right, the bench now- is Caruso, which is like if your best bench guy is like a defensive guard, like. Cruz is a great bench player, but that's not what you want like the headliner off the bench to be. Yeah, exactly. And they have their own wash center in Tristan Thompson, who should not be in a playoff rotation. Well, we have and our other they... wash center in uh, Nikola Vucevic too. So <laughs> we're, we've got two of those now. Yeah. So you have, you have the fact that like Embiid has always owned the bulls. I think that we've just played them with, um with Harden in the rotation and it didn't really give them that much of a scare like I think that the Bulls are a fun story and like I like a lot of the players for sure but like falling apart though yeah exactly and it's like if you look at their records against like the really good teams but once again the goal for the Sixers should not be win a round against the Bulls it should be (laughs) you have Joel Embiid and James Harden like make it to the conference finals make it to the finals or win the finals like I don't Mm want to hear about like you know anything like if, if we win that series great awesome i want them to and like That's i think expected, that would be though exactly and it's like you know we're not gonna se- we're not gonna have celebrations over that um but ultimately i do get a little bit worried I, they play miami tonight we're not gonna take anything from this game just because it's like it's no one's playing like i mean mm-hmm. miami is the one matchup that i'm like I feel like the Sixers could beat them. I feel like they'd be at a coaching disadvantage. They'd be at an athletic disadvantage and probably a shooting disadvantage, which is not great. But ultimately, I think that that is the kind of series where, uh, you know, it is going to be, it's going to be tough when, if Miami can grind the series down to a halt, halt. we have a hard time with movement shooters. But like, if you look at how we match up with them versus how we match up with Boston, Brooklyn, and Milwaukee, I'll take mm-hmm. my chances with Miami in the Chicago Miami section as opposed to the other one because that's just going to be fucking brutal. If the if the yeah. two three is Boston Brooklyn and then I'm sorry uh, Milwaukee and Boston and then Brooklyn is in the first round, like I don't know who's going to come out alive from those three teams. Mm-hmm. Well, with Miami too, like they have all those movement shooters, but a lot of those guys, like they still just have a lot of guys I don't fully like trust on defense or guys I'm not totally scared of on that side. 
and Lowry doesn't get to the rim as much anymore. And I don't know if that's like a, I'm saving it for the playoffs thing, or if that's just what he is now. Well, and then I'm Jimmy 36. Butler. Yeah. And then Jimmy Butler was awful in the playoffs last year. So like, right. I'm still not totally like in fear of the Miami heat or anything. Same. I would say of, I think they're a very good regular season team and I could see them maybe if things break right for them getting to the conference finals, but I personally wouldn't put them in the same tier as like the Boston's the Milwaukee's and then a healthy no. Brooklyn squad. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that uh, like, yeah, like Jimmy's struggles in the playoffs last year definitely were a huge red flag for me. And then you have on top of that, like Bam's good, but Embiid's just going to negate Bam offensively. Like he does every time they play. I think he scored two points last time they played against each other. Um, and in beat struggle too, Bam does a good job defending. Yeah. And as a team, they will do a good job uh, defending Harden and Embiid. I'm not taking that away from them, but I, what I'm saying is ultimately if it comes down to it. The Chicago Miami route should be the route that the Sixers look for. Like if they, like if they are going to go for that route, that's what they should go for. Um, but let's move on from that and just talk very quickly before we get into the March Madness prospect element of this. I don't know if you saw this, but Kevin Durant said that Joel Embiid is the MVP of the league this year. Yes. I don't know what you took from that, but personally, I took it from there was two. I think there were two angles to this. First off, I don't think Kevin Durant is like as agenda based in his comments as like LeBron James. Oh, like, not at all. Yeah. Like, I don't think that he says things to be like, have an angle every time. I think he just kind of says his own opinions and like tells it like it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that, but I do think that there was a little bit of a hidden agenda here of like, well, look, man, if James Harden gets to the playoffs and can't win with the MVP of the league. That's sneaky. I hadn't considered that side of it. I it thought was. it was like a false sense of security thing. I thought Maybe. it was like a move to be like, we'll have him be think that I think he's the best player in the league. So that when we <laughs> play them, we'll have to like up. But the, the Harden angle is 100% the correct takeaway. Like that is absolutely what he was doing there. Yeah, and there's that that element too. I didn't think of that. It's like if we get to the playoffs and we beat the shit out of them, then I could say who's the real best player. Basically, you, yeah, mm -hmm. all that regular season shit is cute, but at the end of the day, yeah. I'm the guy. It's the pro wrestling tactic of like talking up the guy that you're going to beat so that you look even better when you win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Katie, Katie, there's levels to this shit with Katie mm -hmm. apparently now, but I, I do think that 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 was just really cool of him to say. Like, I know that they get into sure. it on the court sometimes. But even just like saying that and recognizing that was really cool. I I personally, I know you listen to the podcast. I don't care about the MVP if they can win a title. I thought it was cool before. Now the goal should not be that. I think resting and beat and making sure that he's healthy for the playoffs should be the number one goal down the stretch here. I don't like, why are you put, like, it, it's whatever, dude. Yeah, especially now that we know there's such a drastic difference in style of play between the playoffs and regular season, that regular season awards in general kind of feel like they're for nerds. A little bit, a little bit. And like, I understand from a legacy perspective, wanting to have an MVP so you can point at it and say, look at my resume, look at whatever. Mm -hmm. But like, I've said it before, like Joel Embiid's the top five player in the NBA right now. No one can take that away from him. And like, even if he never wins an MVP award, I, I'll always think of him as like a great dominant player. And For that's, sure. that's all that matters. Like, I mean, like maybe Giannis or Jokic or one of those guys wins it and, I don't know. That's for to me that that shit is whatever. But I, I, if if he wins, I'll be happy. It's it, it's fine. Um, so let's hop into a little bit of March Madness. So yeah. no one has really been talking about the NBA recently because it's been the first weekend of March Madness. I even you know me, the podcast addict myself, I did not listen to NBA podcasts this past week because I've just been so into March Madness. And since you are a draft guy, you write for mm -hmm. No Ceilings. I wanted to talk a little bit about the top four prospects. So we have to talk about Chet up top, obviously. Chet is the most polarizing prospect I've ever seen in my life. It's I, wild. It's yeah. It's crazy the range of opinions on this guy. For someone who I just recently started watching, I watched a little bit of their conference tournament. Mm -hmm. I watched him in the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament, but I don't know why this guy is so polarizing, but I do at the same time. Like I get yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I get it because he is one of the most unorthodox players I've ever seen in terms of physique, in terms of just build. Like I read something the other day that said he is the same size as same weight as the shortest player in the NBA. 
that and rocks. He's that's 13 so great. to 14 inches tall. Like it mm-hmm. is unheard of. Like we talk about guys coming into the draft skinny, like uh, Mobley and if Porzingis and like all these guys that like the, the, they're told they need to put on weight. Chet is far beyond that. He's 195 pounds at seven foot. And he looks like the Crypt Keeper. It's really crazy. But, <laughs> but what have you taken away from not only his season, but like where do you have him on your big board? Yeah. So right now I have, and it's in flux right now. Like it's nothing's ever final for me until of like the, the day before. So right now I have a top tier of Jabari and Chet. Uh, kind of okay. interchangeable based on who's picking. Um, but you're the, to your point about the chat takes being insane. Um, the other day, and like I, this is so nerdy, but I always think about Chet's fit on the Houston Rockets because to me, he's like the perfect guy for that team because he's going to move the ball, he's going to shoot, he's going to protect the rim. Like he, he just fits everything. He's going to space out the floor for Jalen Green so he can drive. Like everything about it's great. And I tweeted too, I was like, oh, he'd fit so well next to Shangoon because it's kind of like NBA version of Drew Timmy. Uh, but even like, <laughs> but even like Garuba, like a guy who's just going to guard everybody. And that way, like you open him up as a guy who can roll to the basket, like and be a short roll passer, like he was in Spain. Like he would, he could do so much stuff for that team. And then there's some people that are just like, no, he's not an NBA player. He's going to be out of the league in two years. And it's like, whoa, like, yeah. All right. Um, I think the Chet takes are the strongest from the people who haven't watched Chet. And I know that's going to okay. sound like elitist. Um, I don't mean it in that sense. I think. No, you're people, right. Cause I remember looking at him and being like this fucking guy. There's I was no doubtful on chat. I had like, I had like Jalen Dern. I had a chat before the season. Like I was not in on chat. And I think part of it too, is that I think some of the stuff that people hyped about chat before college hasn't translated. Like you okay. would do all sorts of like kooky off the bounce. Like I'm going to dribble behind the back and launch a step back three type shit. When he played a, he was a hooper. Yeah. And like that stuff, he like, he can't do it in college, but he doesn't do it because he knows he can't do it. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of the concerns with Chet are around the fact that he's very skinny. He looks bizarre. He moves kind of weird, um, but he's awesome. And if you watch the games, like uh, my buddy, Steven Gillespie also at No Ceilings calls him like the Venus fly trap. Like every game, there's a play where some center gets the ball and just like pounds him in the post, gets right under the basket and goes up and Chet just still blocks it anyway. He's so long, it doesn't matter if you put him under the basket. Right. That um, is the weird thing about him is that I've seen that a few times where he does he, – he definitely is at a size disadvantage, but because mm-hmm. he has these crazy long arms, it's like he can protect the rim from, like, directly under the rim. It's, it's yeah. one of the weirder things I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't even think that, like – this is something that people have been bringing up. Like, I think the size thing is definitely a concern because yeah. we've never seen anyone like him. Like he is, no, unique. it's weird. He, he's so unique to the point where it's like, he's probably going to end up having to play the four a lot because of his size. And the concern isn't to me like, Oh, he can't guard the Jokic or the Embiid. Like no one can guard those guys. You can't really be mm-hmm. concerned. You can't draft a guy based on that. I guess the concern that a lot of people would have is how is he going to do against NBA big wings? Like is Tobias Harris going to be able to go up and through him? And like, that's not someone who's like an elite wing by any means, but like, are there going to be bigger fours who can kind of challenge him on the block and kind of go through him at the NBA level, just because they're so skilled and strong and big. Um, yeah, first off, sorry if you heard my daughter in the background at all. Yeah, you're good. Five months old, so she's, she's a little crazy. Uh, doesn't respect ball enough. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so here's what I would say about that. I think that I don't worry about Forrest getting through his chest. I don't worry about like very many people in the NBA like just bullying him under the basket. My concern with him is more like the quickness of his feet on defense. Um, there was a play in, I think it was the game they lost against St. Mary's. It might've been the one they won against St. Mary's during the regular season where their center, Matthias Toss, who's like a big dude, just like burned him with a quick spin move. Um, and like his recovery tools are, are good just cause he's so long. Uh, but I worry more about just his feet on the perimeter as a four. I think everything about him is optimized. If he can gain that 30 pounds and play the five regularly, like I wouldn't want him playing the four in a playoff series tomorrow on defense. Uh, but I, but I think he'll get by, I think, especially in the regular season early on. I think he'll be good enough there to stay afloat and, like, stay on the floor and be fine. 
Um, he is just such a good rim protector, though, that like even when he's on the court, teams just don't even go into the paint and teams shoot like 26 percent or like around the basket against him. It's like the numbers are ridiculous. Like teams yeah. don't even go near the basket when he's on the floor. So I think once he gains the weight and he can play the five, he'll be optimized. But I think he's OK at the four. I don't think Forrest will be able to bully him or anything. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's fair. I mean, I, I could understand that concern a little bit just because of the fact that, and especially when it comes to like him putting on 30 pounds and becoming a five, like I read an article from two years ago that his parents said he needed to put on 20 pounds that he's put on five pounds since then. Like, yeah. It, that yeah. Is, it might just be, he never can get to be that size. Like he might gain a little bit of weight just over the course of like getting into a strength and conditioning program in the mm-hmm. NBA and like, really making this like his full-time profession and job. And they're going to have an entire staff of people dedicated to like making sure that he can become bigger. But I do wonder if he maybe just can never really get to the point. It's just kind of the way that his body's made. Yeah. So I'm like, not to get into this, I'm like kind of like a, a bodybuilding nutrition hobbyist guy. Oh, okay. And cool. I, I think everybody can gain the weight. I think the tricky thing is like, people do have genetic predispositions in terms of how they gain it. Like for me, like it's very easy to put on size and like my back and my legs just don't grow. And then other people, Mm -hmm. it's the opposite. And like, that's like a concern with Chad is like, if even if he does gain 30 pounds, how's he going to gain it? Uh, And like Marvin Williams is like the test case for this, where he was a really skinny guy and he gained weight and it was just like all in his legs and ass. And like, he's not (laughs) a vertical athlete anymore. Like Marvin Williams is like a run and jump bouncy four coming out who evolved into being like a very good skilled power forward and whatever. But like his body, he just didn't gain the mass the way that you thought he might. Like, you don't know. You are kind of rolling the dice a little bit as far as like what a guy is going to turn into when you're talking about someone drastically changing their body. Yeah. So that, that is, that could end up being an issue for him on a basketball. Like I can see the appeal of Chet for sure. Mm -hmm. I do wonder what his offensive role at the NBA will be because I, like you said, like he's shown moments and he's had flashes and, and things that he has shown, but ultimately, you know, he seems like a really good shooter. Is he going to be able to create for himself? Is he going to be able to be like, what is he going to be offensively? I guess is my question. So I think this is where I diverge a little bit from like the Chet is number one. Crowd. Okay. I think Chet is best served as like a number two option on offense. Uh, he's a great shooter off of movement already. Like at one point during the season, there was some stat where like his transition effective field goal percentage was over a hundred percent because he was hitting so many threes that like the threes, like each point counts as a percent, whatever. Wow. So like the way that you calculate that stat, like he just drains transition threes and he can catch off of movement and hit. So like, God, like I'm just so fascinated with Chet because like you can run like Spain pick and rolls with him as the bottom guy who runs up yeah. to shoot the three. Like there's just so much weird stuff you can do with him. Um, but I don't think he's gonna create for himself. And I don't really believe in the handle. And like I talked about earlier with like him doing all this behind the back and like putting it on the floor and all that stuff that he did in high school. He hasn't really done it in college. I think he knows it's not his bag. I think that he like he's still like really good at attacking closeouts. If guys fly at him on the perimeter and he pump fakes him, he is so efficient with just like one step, super long jump, and I'm dunking it. Um, so yeah, I to me he's more of a second option. He's a great facilitator. He uses his length to pass exceptionally well. Uh, I noticed so I th- that he had one one or two plays in, in that last game that he 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 really made some impressive reads for a guy his size. Yeah, he he has a, a phenomenal just command of the floor. Always knows where everyone is. Hits cutters well. Like he's he's smart man. Like I think he's going to be just an elite second option. Like, and I don't say second option is like a derogatory thing. Like I think he could be the second best player on a title team. And I think that's really good. Yeah. And I mean, defensive one offensive two is very valuable. And one of the things, the best argument I heard for Chet at one was actually from chucking darts who I've had on the podcast. And Mm -hmm. he basically in Chuck basically said the amount of offensive ones high high end offensive engines that we have in the NBA right now, your Jokic's, your Embiid's, your Luca's, your Trey's, your KD's, your guys that can run an elite offense is so incredibly high that breaking into that tier of creator, that offensive hub is going to be really hard. Even if you're a great prospect, whereas the defensive end, 
there there leaves a lot to be desired. Like there, you can find guys that will not only be able to, you know, kind of keep up and hold together a defense against these elite offenses, but it might be a little bit of a, since everyone's so offensive focused that you just get this elite defensive guy, like an Evan Mobley last year. Mm -hmm. And it turns out to be incredibly valuable at the next level. Yeah. And I, I think Mobley, I liked a lot better on the perimeter than I did chat on defense, especially, um, but and like Mobley is like a like Mobley can actually put it on the floor and do weird stuff. So like I was a little higher on Mobley, I think, than I am on Chet. But I I still think Chet is phenomenal, and I think I think the floor is way higher than people are giving him credit for because of how savvy he is on offense and how unselfish he is. That I think he's going to be totally fine taking that number two backseat kind of role. Cool. And like uh, as you said, like kind of like a connecting piece, a guy who can kind of help gel your offense together instead of being like the main hub of it. So mm-hmm. I just want to say from a production standpoint, you brought up some of the production with Chet. He's one of the things I look for in prospects is like just general production. Like if you're good yeah. at college, you're probably, you know, as long as you're an NBA level athlete and you have NBA level skills, you'll probably be pretty good in the NBA. You'll at least be like a solid rotation player. And Chet is one of three players in the last 10 years to have a BPM of at least 15. So box plus minus. <laughs> That's the such other, a huge number. And the other two are, do you know who they are? I would guess Zion. Zion, this is freshman, yes. So okay. yeah, Zion is one. What was the time frame on it? Okay, so let's say last. Tw- I think it was last twelve years. I'm having my years. Was it? Was it Anthony Davis? It was Anthony Davis. Okay. So it's so Chet is the first freshman since Zion, and before that, it was only AD who have had at least fifteen. Now Zion's was like twenty one. Like he was yeah breaking records. AD had like a eighteen or a nineteen. Chet's just just above that fifteen threshold so like he's put up the production now maybe the size will end up hurting him at the next level becoming whatever he can become we'll see uh i think he's definitely interesting and i think we're going to go back and forth on this if i had to guess right now i ultimately think that he gets talked back into being the number one overall pick like i think i could see it yeah we go through cycles where it's Mm -hmm. like okay this guy is the guy and there are four guys in this draft that could have an argument well maybe at least three guys who could have an argument for that number one pick and then one guy who we'll also talk about for a little bit who could be in the conversation as well but one of the things is that i think as we get further away from like like playing the actual games people not being as caught up in the moment with things i think that generally speaking it goes back to whoever the consensus was before this so like it seems like jabari is the consensus now and chet was the consensus for a good stretch Mm -hmm. of time and i feel like over time it's gonna end up being one of those two and we could just talk a little bit about jabari now but i mean he obviously pops you you know what you're like the i'll put it like this i think that people can be a little bit i think that the people that are dismissive of chet from one end saying he's not even going to be an nba player Mm -hmm. are probably being ridiculous just based on his production and what he's shown so far and I think people that are like Chet diehards that are like, no, this guy's definitely going to be a star or superstar are being a little bit, maybe, maybe too much as well. And I think <laughs> that the guy like Jabari, you could show anyone his game and they would be like, oh, he's a massive dude who has a cannon for a shot. So of course the majority of people are going to gravitate towards a guy like that. So tell us a little bit about Jabari some of his strengths yeah. and some of his weaknesses and why you have him in the top tier with Chet. So Jabari is the safest guy in this draft. I would say he's six foot 10 and he shot, I believe 42% from three on the yeah. year. Um, yeah. And it got yeah. better throughout the year. Too, yeah. 42% right. on five and a half attempts per game. Um, he's unafraid of contact. He took around five free throw attempts per game too. He he's willing to go to the basket. Um, he's very competitive. I think that's like one of the first things that jumped out to me early in the season before there was a lot of, a lot of like top pick buzz about him um, was like in the first game of the season, he was like slapping the floor and like clapping and getting in dudes faces against like Lamar or some like shit tier D one school, <laughs> like just going wild, like picking on these guys. Um, he 
something that is like criticized about him is he's kind of slow to jump a lot of the time. So like, he's not, even though he's six ten and long, he's not much of a rim protector. He's more of a perimeter oriented defender. Like you can switch him onto guards and he'll do a phenomenal job. Gets real low in his stance. Like just awesome, awesome, awesome. Switching down the lineup. Um, offensively. I don't think he has the passing juice that somebody like Chet does. Um, he's, he's really big and he knows he's really big and it seems like he's never really had to take on a big creative burden. It's just a lot of like, I'm going to take this shot over you, or I'm going to take one dribble here, another dribble here and shoot it. Uh, A lot of, a lot of step backs, a lot of turnaround over his left and his right shoulder. Uh, A lot of, a lot of that sort of stuff. One dribble pull up. He knows who he is at the elbow. Exactly. Like that's, that's his game. He doesn't get all the way to the rim very often, which is, concerning and he's not as good of a finisher as you would like somebody who's 6'10 to be uh and there's real concern about his handle um i call it the big initiator problem in general is it like if you are a big initiator you're gonna turn the ball over a lot because it's so easy just to get into your handle of course. um and you're he just tall. doesn't have a, yeah and like he <laughs> yeah. just doesn't have a lot of craft with with the ball like he's not like if you just had like him and paulo dribble next to each other like you would think Paulo is a much better player just based on that. But um, I do worry that we get into the Giannis has no bag territory with Jabari. We're like all the criticisms of him are like, how does he create? Like, how does he do this and that? And it's like, he's 6'10 and he shoots over guys and he makes all of the shots. Yeah. Uh, so to me, I don't know. I'm a little more bullish on him just because I think him being so big and so tall and able to shoot over people is going to translate very well. Um and I think the fact that his dad was a pro player, um, the fact that he like, has relationships with people like Kevin Durant and people like that, like I think there's enough people invested in him that things like putting together a couple moves he can hit consistently off the dribble will, will, will get him where he needs to be. Uh, he's another guy who needs to gain a little bit of weight. It's yeah, pretty much true of all these guys. They're 18 years old, so a yeah. lot of them are, are still pretty skinny, uh, except Paulo. Uh, but yeah, like it's it's going to be fine. I, I think he's really good. I think the thing with him is just, can you see him being the number one option on an offense? And I don't, I think he has like a cleaner translation than Chet. Um, but he just isn't super creative with the ball and he doesn't have a great handle and guys that don't have those two things usually aren't a number one option. Gotcha. Yeah. It, it is funny. You say that about uh, Jabari. I feel like, well, first off, I, the fact that Chet and Jabari both don't have bags, they're sliding down my board right now. I'm, well, Chet, I'm... Chet has like a little bit of a bag. Like Chet <laughs> like couldn't do some interesting stuff in transition. Um, but Jabari's game is very simple. Is well, how pa- I would describe I'm it. just going to say Paulo and Ivy, like they just, they're hoopers. Like they like, are. They're hooper. Like I've only watched a little bit of them and I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, they have hooper brain. And I well, love that. Paulo's personally. a better hooper though, because Ivy is like afraid to shoot in the mid range. Ivy's taken Ooh. like 29 mid range shots this entire season. Oh man. So he's a more, he's more ball pilled. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Paulo's, the, if you're go- just going by like hooper rankings, uh, Paulo's oh, number for sure. one. By far. Yeah, Paolo, you can tell Paolo's a hooper because his favorite player was Jason Tatum. And I was like, yeah, of course. Yeah, so yeah. that's incredible. And also yeah, makes it's... me feel 900 years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about if he, he goes to Duke, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if he's a Celtics fan, but I, I know that he he had tweeted before that Tatum was his favorite player in the NBA like a year or two ago, um, which makes a lot of sense if you watch his game. But kind mm-hmm. of going back to Jabari, like, I definitely understand just based on the little bit that I've watched the stuff that I've read about him. I, okay. So I guess the one thing, because we, we can't really comp anyone for Chet. Mm -hmm. Like Chet is such a unique player that he doesn't really feel like he has a direct comp. Not that most players do like everyone's Mm -hmm. different. And like, sometimes get caught up with comp stuff where like Mm -hmm. for two years now, people have been trying to come up with a maxi comp and I'm like, maybe he's just his own guy. Like, I don't know. And I do think that uh, some of the comps I've heard for Jabari are weird and interesting. I've mm-hmm. I've seen everything from Ben Pfeiffer's uh, Sadiq Bay plus uh, plus. I've seen M- Michael Porter Jr. with better defense. I've seen. Uh, I'm, I'm just telling you what I've read on Twitter. And Michael this Porter is- Jr. World, like Michael Porter was so fluid with the ball. Like Jabari is just like a little stiffer with it. Like Sadiq Bay plus plus is kind of a, a, an amusing one. I don't hate that. Yeah. Um, the one I've been sort of workshopping is like, what if he's just jumbo clay Thompson? That's okay. So I saw friend of the podcast, Dean on draft. 
Uh, tweet, <laughs> not really parody satire. Wait, no, Dean, Dean said that. Dean tweeted that yesterday. During, all right, I gotta go ago. delete yeah. all of my posts. <laughs> workshop, awesome. you gotta workshop that one a little bit yeah. better. Oh no! no. But th that's the thing is that I I could see that and like yeah, if you're massive Clay Thompson, sign me up. Like yeah, it, and that's that's the thing is like I I just see him as a guy who's gonna play outstanding perimeter defense and shoot a ton. I think so. Here's Richard like Lewis was another one. Richard I Lewis is is not a bad yeah. one at all. Yeah. I think. The way I look at it is like if I'm starting with nothing, I think I'd rather roll the dice on Jabari. Like if I'm just like a completely desolate franchise and I need like somewhere to start, I think I'd rather roll the dice on Jabari because I think he's safer. But I do think that like if you just work on his dribbling and like finding a few ways to get separation, bulk him up so you can finish at the rim a little better, I think he profiles more to be a franchise guy. But if I'm a team, but like you look at the fits for Chet and they're so good. Like him yeah. in Oklahoma city, him in Houston. Like there are so many teams where it's like, we drop this guy in and we might be off to the races that I think he's going to have a real kind of advantage. It, just like from a team building standpoint, but there's a lot of those like rebuilding teams that have a couple guard pieces already. Um, that, yeah, it's, it might work in his favor. Interesting. It, it sounds like you're talking yourself into Chet number one overall uh, as we go throughout the podcast. I'm just yeah, saying. I mean, I've I I I still like just from a, I always do my board is like in a vacuum, and I think in a right. vacuum I take Jabari, but I think Chet makes a lot more sense, and I think they're close enough that yeah, no, uh, I'm it, not going to beat anybody up over it. No, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about Paulo and Ivy. We'll just hit on those mm -hmm. real quick before we get into some targets that the Sixers could potentially get after in the next draft. So. Paulo is – I don't really know much about Paulo other than the fact that he was like a clear number one or two coming into the season, and he might have slipped a little bit over the season in some people's minds. So now he's more in that 3-4 range. So what do you see with Paulo, and uh, why Why did he slip? Yeah, so – so I had Paulo one for a long time. I was like a big Paulo holdout, and I'm kind of like talking myself back into Paulo again. Um, I had him four on my last board. He's out. He's like already back up to three ahead of Ivy. Um, he just had, he has a bag like that man just has so much wiggle off the dribble. Um, and something he's done better in important games is get to the rim. The one thing that drives me nuts with him is like, he can make mid range shots and it's like, but you don't need to do that. Like you're so much bigger and stronger and more powerful than these guys just get to the rim. Uh, but he's an awesome passer. I do think like yeah, as, yeah, I noticed that. the thing that killed me is like as the season went along and like people were dropping him down boards, the reason I was holding out on him was like his passing got better throughout the season. His shooting got worse. Like he his shooting took a dip. And that's kind of when people started to kind of look at Chet and Jabari a bit more. But like he really started to get back in the groove. The other thing with Paulo is because of COVID, he like did not play very much the last few years. And that's sort of true for Chet also, but Jabari never stopped playing. Uh, like he just kept playing throughout the pandemic, basically. So with Paulo, it's like he's sort of kind of getting reinvigorated in a lot of senses. But you you definitely see it with like his just like processing of the game, his decision making and his passing. Defensively, I have some real concerns. Like there's moments when he's locked in, and he's really good, but there are times too where like he just makes puzzling decisions. Um, there was a play toward the end of the North Carolina game that they got blown out in that like one of the plays that sealed, it was like a play late where him and AJ Griffin just like had horrible communication on a switch. And Paulo ended up just like completely clearing out the lane for a wide open dunk. And it's like, Oh no. Like I, I really worry about him as a defender. I think the offense is going to be so good that it won't like kill. Like, I don't think he's Marvin Bagley bad. Yeah. Um, and I think his offense is a lot better and more translatable. And I do think he's going to shoot it from three eventually. Like I, I buy the shot with him. Um, but he's, I don't think he's going to be a, a good defender at the end. Of the day. I think he could be he, like, he could work his way up to solid, but I just don't anticipate it being something that like he's known for. Well, he's a Hooper. He doesn't have time for that, but yeah. <laughs> I, w I will say he looks like a star. That he is does. the one thing he really has. And I get a little bit worried about those guys sometimes. And it's like, you know, he obviously has the pedigree. He has the background. The passing was something that I, going into this tournament, I had I knew nothing about the passing. And mm -hmm. I've been very impressed by the passing. It's he had that so little, good. that interior uh, pass that he had to the guy that was in the dunker spot yesterday. I'm sorry, I'm mm -hmm. forgetting. It's probably name. Mark Williams, I'm guessing. Yeah, Mark Williams, okay. that was his name. He had a uh, interior pass off the dribble that I was like, wow, I did not know he could pass like that. And he has had 
these flashes where I'm like, I get, I get why people really like him as a prospect and we're arguing for him to go number one. Uh, I just, I, it's funny about the, uh, the defense thing. First off, Hoopers don't care about defense. <laughs> Second off, uh, if you just are good enough on offense that I think that people will just let you get away with it and it won't yeah. really matter until you're in the playoffs and then teams are, you know, taking advantage of those defensive things. He seems like a pretty safe bet. Um, I don't really know what to make of, you know, him falling, like you said, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I think maybe I'm just a little bit Hooper pilled, but I feel like he, in a few years, we could come away from this. Just, once again, only having watched the AC, ACC mm-hmm. tournament, and as you said, he seems to have gotten better throughout the year, but watching the ACC tournament, watching March Madness, and and coming away being like, I see see something with this guy that I think that, at the next level, uh, if he gets to the right team that he could end up being like a future star. And just real quick too, I just want to say like coach K has sucked this year. Like he's yeah. just been an awful coach that hasn't helped him at all. And like, to your point about the interior passing, like some of Duke's lineups have no spacing and it. Like I posted a couple of clips a while ago on Twitter of him, like driving and the lane is just unfathomably clogged. And he's still just like fitting these passes through super tight windows. Like, and that's that's the thing that like Jabari doesn't have is just like the ability to score for yourself and like create for others. Like Paulo's a chef and Jabari's an eater. And like that's that's kind of my concern. Yeah, like that's just my concern with like with passing on Paulo. It's just like, are we gonna look back at this and be like, yeah, he was on a poorly coached Duke team that didn't have good spacing and yeah, like, of course, he's going to get better at shooting. He already has great touch in the mid range. And his and the thing is, too, like, I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, well, what's he going to do? Like, if he's not the star or whatever, he dribbles the air out of the ball and whatever. His spot up numbers on synergy are great. He's a good spot up shooter. He's going to be fine in that role. I don't think he's going to, like, pout if he doesn't have the ball every single play. So that's good to know. I, and he's Italian, too. So, you know, he's a good chef. Um, I had to slip that one in there. Uh, but um, so let's just talk a little bit about Ivy, who being Hooper pilled, I've I've kept my eye from a distance. I've had my eye on Ivy pretty much the whole season. I've heard mm-hmm. some very good things about him. I've watched a few Purdue's games, even going into the tournament, just because I find him to be very entertaining. And I think that uh, I could see him having success at the next level. Let's just talk a little bit about the John Morant comparison because I, the thing about the John Morant comparison is like, John's another one of those guys where I'm like, ah, he's so unique. Like, how can you comp anyone to Jaw when Jaw is like a top 100 percentile athlete with inc- an incredibly fluid handle? It's scoring punch. He's now developed a shot. Like, to me, Comparing anyone to Jaw is a fool's errand. Like I think Yeah, it's that, unfair. Like, I can see because because Ivy's incredibly athletic and because he pops, because he is a hooper and he has mm-hmm. these amazing plays offensively and even sometimes defensively he had like that chase down block in the game the other day. Like I can see why, but like what do you make of the Ja Morant comparison and, and what do you think about Ivy in general? So I think a big reason that came up is the Ja Ivy connection. So okay. I don't know if you're aware of this. So Ivy's mom, Niel Ivy, is currently the Notre Dame women's head coach. Before okay. that, she worked in player development for the Grizzlies. Oh. So Morant and like Ivy are kind of like buddied up. They've worked out together and stuff like that. So I think that like planted the seed for a lot of people to be like, oh, athletic guard. Uh, the mom knows him. It's uh, He's John Morant. And like, I look, I love Jay Nivey. I think he's a firm number four. Like I have him behind these guys, but I wouldn't put anybody else behind him ahead of him. Um, I I just think it's too much. I, I love Jay Nivey's athleticism. I love his ability. His that's another guy who's like passing has just taken a gigantic step forward throughout this season. And he's making reads. But he's like, a sophomore, right? He's not. Yeah. Even a so last yeah. year he was he was good, but he could he didn't shoot very well. But he was a good shooter in high school, and now this year he's shooting. Um, so he makes like really good decisions at top speed. Like he will just fly into the paint. He like, to me, he has a lot of Tyrese Maxey in him. Like he has like the catch and go, like that kind of stuff on the perimeter. Um, But every time I watch Ja, I'm just like, it's unfair to Jaden Ivey to do this to him. Like Ja, Ja's just Ja. Like that's, that's him. That's it. Ivey will be a great athlete. He'll be far above average in the NBA. But I, I think that is just like a bridge way too far for me. Um, but yeah, Ivy's really good. He can shoot. He's get, he's going to get into the paint. His another guy who like 
he has a lot of guard shooters, but they have a lot of bigs who are very plotting and take up a lot of space in the paint. Um, so I think he'll look a little better with spacing at the course, next level. Too. College basketball, we love it. Uh, that's, yeah. it. It is one of the things that has made watching these last few weeks of, of college basketball kind of painful to me. It's like sometimes the offenses, I'm just like, put, put me out of my misery. Holy shit, this is brutal. Yeah, but, so, so they have a 7-4 center, Zach Eady, and I've a 6-10 seen him. center, He's, Trefion yeah. Williams. And it's before crazy. the season, the coach was talking about playing both of the centers at the same time. <laughs> and he didn't do it. Ellen like, Brand's their coach? <laughs> and like the entire off season i was just like please matt painter do not do this to jay Ivey. like do not play these two guys at the same time well i'm glad that he didn't but yeah that guy zach mm-hmm. Eady is fucking massive holy well shit. as he... dean on draft is, is pointed out are you sure you want to draft chet when you can get zach Eady in the second round oh okay so he's not a check guy so i need to reevaluate no. and maybe no i'm <laughs> no oh, but that well, is his I mean... take yeah, I'm sure there's some race science uh, reason behind that. Um, uh, so anyway, um, quick thing. We didn't get any Polo comps. Can you give me one Polo comp? Because the people, the piggies love comps. So um, we Jesus. need to get, what What would be your closest comp for him? Or like, what have you heard that has been thrown around there? I guess I haven't um, really read any Polo comps. but The, the um, one that you used to get a lot was like Carmelo mixed with Blake Griffin. And I think that's like actually a pretty decent offensive comp. Where like he's a sounds like an amazing player. (laughs) Yeah, where it's like he kind of has like the passing savvy that Blake had, but he has like kind of the wiggle that Carmelo has, not to the same degree. And like I don't think he's probably going to be the same level of score as Carmelo. He's a little more ground bound like Carmelo, but there are definitely like blends of each of those guys in his game. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I saw someone describe him as a hyper athletic Tobias Harris, which is funny to me because Carmelo, Tobias, whatever. (laughs) But um, you know, obviously Tobias is has his own issues and he's not mm-hmm. nearly the level of passers Paulo is as a prospect. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the Sixers prospects. So yeah. I have a list of guys that keep in mind, I've only watched some of the tournament games, the conference tournaments and mm-hmm. the uh, NTA tournament, the four guys yeah. that I had, and I want to just get your opinions on them real quick mm-hmm. are from Ohio state, EJ, EJ Liddell. Yes. Who I, yes. I just don't understand how this guy isn't going higher. Um, I've only watched a a handful of his games, but I'm like, this guy just has NBA role player, like good role player written all over him to me. I agree. Um, Caleb Houston, who I only saw that. I know that he struggled this year, but I saw him in that, um, in that one game when he caught fire and I'm like, Mm -hmm. Oh, a wing who can shoot the Sixers need those. Yeah. Um, And then Blake Wesley from Notre Dame. Okay. Um, I'm not a Blake Wesley guy. Okay. And then Malachi Branham from Ohio state. Okay. So what do you, what let's start up top with Liddell. What do you like about Liddell? Cause I, I've been talking this guy up. I love you. So EJ Liddell, um was a guy who was good in college and last year he was a sophomore and he did like the pre-draft process i think he went to the g league elite camp and like didn't even make it to the nba combine um he was a lot heavier and he was very slow on his feet uh so like he just like struggled laterally he like was he was like a starting to develop a shot but like didn't really have one so he's sort of like this bulky six seven power forward who like doesn't have great positional size and like isn't super quick and can't really shoot. So like, yeah, he was not a pro prospect. Came back to school this year, has lightning quick reflexes. Like this guy reacts to stuff so quick on the court and is so smart that like he just sees something and he gets there in two seconds and he blocks almost three shots a game now because of it. Yeah. Um, and when he's had to guard guys like Paulo and guys like Johnny Davis, like he is hung with them. No problem. Like the lateral quickness is not going to be an issue for him at all. He's hitting like 40% of his threes. Now a awesome passer, like yeah, once every couple games we'll have like about him too. just a like holy shit style pass. Um, I am a firm, firm believer in EJ Liddell, and I think a good team is going to take him. And then like later, people are gonna be like, "Why didn't this team draft EJ Liddell?" Like he's gonna yep. be like one of those guys that like everyone feels stupid for not taking later. Yeah, and it's the thing with the players who are a little bit older. They're twenty one. Mm-hmm. You know, he's gonna be twenty two next season. But there's value in that because teams that are swinging for younger guys that might have more quote unquote more upside might end up missing out on a guy who can you can plug and play as a really good role player right away. And this keep in mind the Sixers might not even have their pick. It depends if the Nets to choose to defer the pick or if they trade their pick 
uh, if the the team that gets it. But as we discussed pre-podcast, I think it's pretty likely that the Nets or whoever gets the Nets pick says, okay, we could take the 23rd or 24th pick in this draft. Or we could take the chance that one of Embiid or Harden, knock on wood, get hurt next season or something goes off the rails and Philly's a disaster next year and it turns into a end of the lottery pick or you know b- borderline lottery pick. So mm-hmm. Liddell's the number one guy that I want this to get, especially if they keep Doc Rivers as coach, because we know fucking he ain't playing anyone that's under 22. So, no, no. so you have the, you have the advantage of being able to, and like the Sixers need size. They need guys who are wings that can shoot and pass and defend and do all of the things that Liddell, I'm I'm confident this guy's going to be at least a solid rotation player in the NBA, if I not so more. Too. So mm-hmm. I think that, I think that, uh, he's a guy that I, I definitely would have as, as my number one guy for the Sixers going into next season. Let's talk about Blake Wesley, who you're not as high on. What is, yeah. what, what, what is it with Blake Wesley? He's a bit of a hooper too. I watched some of, he especially is. that, that Rutgers game. He was, he, he kind of, he, 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 he had some difficulties in that game, but what, what do you uh, not like about him? I just think he's a project. Like, I don't think he's a bad basketball player. I, if you told me he has a great NBA career starts, I wouldn't doubt it. Um, a lot of, a lot of Karis Levert in his game. Yeah. Like now that you mentioned the Hooper thing. Yep. Um, he, so I have a couple big concerns with him. I don't think he's going to be ready out of the gate at all. Um, he, the one thing I will give him is I, he's like not as productive as a defender as you would think like an athletic six, five guy with a six eleven wingspan is sounds like Karis Levert, <laughs> but like, but to his credit, like in these tournament games where he's played really bad on offense, he has tried so hard on defense and you're like, Oh, you can defend. Like you right. are fine on this end. Like you're not, and he's never been a negative, but um, it, it gave me like a lot of optimism about what he could become as a defender um, on offense. He was like a 30% three point shooter this season. And his shot looks different every single time he shoots. Mm um it's because like early in the season like i started like watch the first couple games and i was like i'm all in on this guy and then like you just watch him over and over again it's like oh you shoot different every single time yeah Uh, the other thing with him is like he kind of runs like point guard for notre dame which i think is actually great for his development and i now with nil like i kind of want more guys to go back to school and just like just like figure this stuff out before you come into the league like just come in a little bit more ready um yeah of course his like his handle and his passing can be really good, but there are other times where he gets total tunnel vision. Um, the game that I started to get leery of him was there was a game. It was on MLK day. They played Howard and it was just like standalone game. Nothing else is on TV watching Notre Dame versus Howard. And like they had to yank him down the stretch. Cause like he just dribbled into traffic a few times, like was passing the ball through windows that like clearly were not there. Just like two guys in the way. And he's just like dishing it right in, into their arms. That sounds uh, like a perfect sixer. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I, I just think he's raw. Like, I think he's going to be a good player. I think he's a guy that if he ends up with the right developmental organization or like a team that's like willing to just be like, Hey, figure it out, man, take your time. Right. It'd be great. But like, for me, he's a guy and I don't think he's going to go back to school. Like I think, I think too many people see the world in him and they kind of should, uh, but for a team like the Sixers, I just don't think he would be in a position to succeed with them. Yeah, and I also think like the Sixers should be looking for guys they can play in the rotation right now. If, yeah. if you're going to keep your pick, which, hey, they might not. They might use it to get off the Tobias Harris contract. They might use it to just get a veteran role player. Like mm-hmm. There are ways to you know kind of use the pick and not use it in the draft. But if you are going to use it in the draft, like – uh, Jaden Springer was someone I was very high on going into the draft. Well, Springer, and like, yeah. He was not able to crack the rotation this year. And th- now that you have hardened, your timeline has shifted. Like mm-hmm. last year, and I've heard a lot of people argue against the Springer pick throughout the year. And I was like, but at the time it was, to- first off, I just still like Jaden Springer as a prospect and think it will be a good NBA player eventually. <laughs> yeah. But at the time it was totally justifiable because like, what did the Sixers have? Like, you had yeah like you had a bunch of garbage at, the, at those guard spots and like yeah. also what pick was he in the draft was he like 22nd 27. he was he, yeah he was like 11th or 12th on my board and like i was yeah. lower on him than like a lot of the big draft twitter people too so like yeah when a guy that like highly touted is available at that spot on the board it's hard to not take them yeah you just do it and you figure out the rest later and and yeah. one of the things that i've thought about is the fact that like since he was not able to crack the rotation, I'm looking for guys that like could have the potential to do that, which is why I'm so high on Liddell. But let's mm-hmm. just talk real quick. Give me your opinions on Caleb Houston, who is also very young. Yeah. And struggled this year. And then mm-hmm. uh, 
I believe is it is it Malachi Branham or how Malachi you say Branham? Okay, yeah. Malachi Branham. Okay, yeah. um, so just give me your quick notes on those two because I know yeah. you got to get out of here. Uh, so Caleb Houston, I actually really like. He's six eight. He can shoot. Um, his feet like aren't great yet, and he's also really skinny. Um, so bigger guys are going to give him trouble. I think he's a guy that like. And I don't know. I think, I think people haven't caught up with how the NBA like works developmentally now. Like you say like, Oh yeah, he's a guy you draft and put in the G league and so he sucks right now. And it's like, no, he doesn't <laughs> suck. Like it's just really hard to play in the NBA right away now. James uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so like, I think he's a guy that you draft, you take in the G league, you just work with him athletically on like putting on weight and keeping up his foot speed. And that's it. Like everything else is there. He's a really good decision maker. Like he's a guy that if he's chased off the line, he can make some really sharp passing decisions. Um, so I like him a lot. I think he's going to be a good pro. I, I, again, like he's just a guy that it's going to depend on organizational fit and somebody to be patient with him. Um, Branham, I need to like pay more attention to and do more film work on. Cause for so long, like I watched Ohio state just looking at Liddell and this brand of breakout happened toward the back half of the season, like midway okay. through the season, um people started to take notice of him and like there was one point where i tweeted out i was like he's like outperforming a lot of these like one and done guys like when are we going to start talking about him like that and then matt penny from game theory tweeted at me and he was like it's gonna happen like this week and i'm like it did. uh <laughs> yeah exactly so yeah so like he he can really make a lot of tough shots he hit like 40 some percent of his threes i don't know if he's actually that good of a shooter like he still has some like occasional just bad misses uh, he can over dribble, but to me, that's like you're on a team where nobody can dribble, so that's gonna yeah, that happen. Team's like outside of Liddell and Brandon, so I'm not yeah. really surprised. So I, I, I'm not worried about that too much. Um, he's not great chasing guys around screens, but again, like like Wesley, he looked better at it during the tournament. So it's like you probably just, like you're carrying such a heavy offensive burden, you're probably just not caring that much a lot of the time. And then when you have to, you can do it. So I like him. I think he's another guy that probably just needs a little bit of time to figure it out it's so like out of those guys like liddell is the guy that i would 100 percent want and i'm glad that you yeah. mentioned him because he's like the guy for the sixers for me yeah i mean he makes the most sense they need i mean they need anyone who can be a wing that can do all the things i mentioned i think being able to plug a guy into the rotation not have to worry about the development as much should be a high priority for them and i'm usually a guy who's talking about these other guys who are projects who are higher upside swing, whatever you want to call yeah. it at the, even at the end of the first, I'm like very much for that kind of process. But now that the Sixers window has shifted and they have James Harden and Joel Embiid in, you know, somewhat the prime of post prime of James Harden's career in the prime of Joel Embiid's career. I think that taking a guy like Liddell at the end of the first makes the most sense. So mm -hmm. Maxwell, thank you so much for coming on. I really yeah. appreciate it, dude. Um, tell the people where they can follow you and I'll put your mm -hmm. link in the description. Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, no ceilings NBA is where you can find all of, uh, the work from no ceilings. So follow them on Twitter. That's where all my work is. Um, I'm on Twitter at bound boards, B A U M boards. Uh, I'm going to be writing there. So all my stuff will be there. You'll get some cool videos of prospects doing stuff from time to time. Uh, all the draft takes everything draft related over there. Awesome. Thanks dude. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. Peace.